Might as well. Good morning, folks. Jeff, am I doing announcements today? All right. Before I say anything else, we've got some glasses lost and found. Did anybody lose their glasses? It's got to be somebody. They're not mine. I'll, I'll, I'll keep them. If anybody uh, decides later on that they did lose their glasses, you can let me know. Oh, they were from last week? Oh, okay. I thought they were from this morning. Last week, somebody lost their glasses. People online? <laughs> well, Larry will know. They can comment there. Um, so, here we go. Welcome. Um, first thing on my list up here is that the uh, celebration of life for Gail Dilka is coming up on March 26th at 10 o'clock at North Point. That's the simple truth that's up the hill. So 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, March 26th for Gail Dilka. Um, prayer requests via our website, or you can contact us on our cell phones. Um, and although we are encouraged to visit our website, I just heard from... John, that our women's ministry stuff is very outdated, so I'm going to poke around at that when I get home this afternoon and see if I can get that fixed, at least so that it's for this current year and it doesn't tell you to meet at the office, which <laughs> is not ours anymore. Uh, yeah. Sorry, that's my bad. I've got um, some... Recent updates from our friends who are helping in Ukraine. Um, my friends Jake and Anya Knotts, who are at the border in Poland. Um, they put out an update yesterday, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just this m one part of it. It says, most urgently, what have become increasingly more pressing is uh, they've been coordinating evacuations from Ukraine, meaning that they are renting buses hiring drivers and making bonsai runs into the uh, the country to um, pull people out, which is, as you guys have probably seen, just nutty because the Russians have been targeting just cars driving down the road and hospitals and everything else. So um, we uh, want to keep on praying for them. Um, it's one of those things where they're, getting intelligence reports for troop movements and trying to decide, is it going to be safe enough for us to make this route or are we going to get bombed on that route? And so that it's like an hour by hour thing. Um, and they're also trying to help distribute humanitarian aid, medical aid on both sides of the border in Poland. Um, they are helping to settle refugees that have come across the border, uh, you know, and then try to help them long-term, wherever they're going to end up. And they're also, I saw a, a Facebook post, they are helping to distribute body armor and, and helmets and stuff like that. They're actually bringing that stuff into Ukraine. And they had like a room full of body armor that somebody shipped over from California. Yeah, pretty crazy. I don't even know where I would get body armor in California, and they're sending it to Ukraine. Um, so that makes their job pretty dangerous too. You can imagine if that you've got that in your van going in and you're pulling out orphans on your way out. Pretty crazy. So um, we're going to be praying for them. That's Jake and Anya Knotts. And then my friends uh, Stephen and Teresa Yates, they're in Moldova, which is also right across the border from the Ukraine. And uh, he says this, I'm surrounded by real heroes. These are folks really doing the work, volunteers from churches and Christian organizations that have been working tires, tire, tirelessly since day one. Many are my good friends. Many are now new friends. All of them united with one purpose, to share the gospel in word and deed with our Ukrainian friends for the glory of God. They are, they are literally serving thousands every day. So he shared with, with uh, us, he's got a newsletter, and if you send me your uh, email address somehow. I'll get it to him, and then he can 
uh, start sending you uh, those newsletters. Um, you can text me your email address. You can. A lot of people have been sending it to me on Facebook Messenger, and I'll just give that to Stephen, and, and you can get those same uh, newsletters. And I've had a lot of people that have been wanting to funnel money to these organizations, and um, I've personally, from people here in the room, sent about two thousand dollars to Ukraine, which is awesome, but not not really a thing that I want to do through my own bank account. So if you want to send money to Ukraine, there's these tithe envelopes in the back. Please put your check in there and write Ukraine on it, and then we'll figure out what to do with it from there. But it'll go to either Jake and Anya Knotts that are in Poland, or it'll go to Stephen and Teresa in Moldova, or one of the organizations that they're working with and they trust. And I, I know these people personally. I trust them. All of the money that goes to them is going to go directly to people who need it. They're not taking any of it themselves. So... Um, there's also GoFundMe that I can give you a link for, and there's also, I guess that's it right now. That they're, Stephen and Teresa are trying to compile a list of organizations that they're working with, because I think he's in the same position that I'm in, where people are just sending him probably more like tens of thousands of dollars into his personal account, and then he's trying to distribute it to people who need it, and I don't think that's a thing that he wants to do. Um, so he's going to put together a list that we can be uh, contributing to. Any questions about that? Because I know I kind of butchered it a little bit. All right. Yeah, sorry. Write them to Simple Truth. And um, apparently you don't want to put that in Ukraine in the memo, but just put it in this envelope with Ukraine on it so that we know that's earmarked for those people. All right. So uh, let's see what else we got going on. Uh, Tuesday morning prayer at Ken Karen Kinney's house. You can contact her or Jan for uh, that. And also, of course, the emergency prayer chain. You can contact them if you would like to be prayed for for something going on. Um, Wednesday evening Bible studies. Hey, it's uh, daylight savings, so I guess I get to be outside again from now on Wednesday nights. I always like teaching out on my deck. Uh, there might be goats in my videos from now on, so... I'll try to have it positioned in a w somewhere that you don't see them, you know, pooping on screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll. they're little. They're tiny little guys, and I've got a bunch of babies. I'll, I'll get them on the screen this Wednesday. Um, it's a matter of how far my Wi-Fi reaches into my yard, but uh, it should be okay. I think I can do it from the front yard. I get them on my deck actually all the time too. So if they're loose, they probably will just walk up on the deck, which that's where I normally am. We're in Joshua, by the way, on Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, if you're watching live on Facebook. Uh, men's morning Zoom meetings on Friday mornings at 9. You can get a hold of Steve and he can get you in, uh, an invite for that meeting for Zoom. Oh, yeah, Friday mor um, Easter services. Those are coming up soon. So Good Friday is April 15th. We're doing that at noon, right? There's no uh, times on here. Noon. That's up there? Okay, good. Noon. Good Friday, just like we always do. Um, you can bring f fresh flowers to put on the cross that we have up here all the time, every year. And then um, Easter Sunday, we're doing one service at 10, normal time. So. You can bring flowers on Easter Sunday also. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Now we're getting into prayer requests. So we're praying for, uh, still praying for Petra's grandson, Christopher. Um, Don Kerr, who's got the compression fracture in her spine. Um, she's up and around though, right? I mean, I've, I've heard that they're, they're not doing anything on her just yet, but she's not like bedridden, which is... Good news. Um, Kathy's, your sister-in-law passed away? Okay. Um, Leah Brush, who's, I guess, a former teacher um, at Forest Lake. She has leukemia. And so we're going to be praying for her. 
Um, and she's looking f at uh, finding out what's going, like their sort of medical prognosis. And Oh, you know? Okay. They're looking for a bone, barren marrow donor. Okay. They're looking for a bone marrow. Okay. Um, and we have the misplays here today. I'm glad to see you guys. Praise God. Um, that's all the new stuff that I see here. So, oh yeah, keep David climbing our prayers. He's still looking forward to surgery in May. He's in a lot of pain. Okay, we'll definitely be praying for him. All right, anybody else have anything that I'm neglecting to mention? Well, let's pray then. Father God, we thank you for um, the faithfulness of your love and your, your mercy on us, Lord, and all these prayer requests that we left up to you, including um, our servicemen and women and the people that we know and love in Ukraine or who are outside the borders of Ukraine, Lord, we ask that you would um, pour out your protection and your blessing on them. For those who are uh, in medical need, like David Klein, Lord, we pray that you would uh, heal him and be his comforter and his, uh, just his, his father that he can come and run to and be comforted by. And Lord, we ask that as we come before you in, your, in worship, or that you would be glorified by our praise and worship of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let's stand. Your grace is enough.
Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the fetter that binds us to you. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help us always to remember where we came from and how we got to where we are now by your grace. Lord, as we open your word now, Lord, I ask that you would teach us, help us to understand what you have to say to us, help us to apply your word to our lives. And Lord, we want to uh, lift up also um, Forrest, praise you for that healing, and also we're going to lift up Delano as he is waiting expectantly to enter heaven. Lord, we pray that you would be his comfort and that uh, his life and his passing would bring you glory as well. And uh, as we ask for your blessing, Lord, we pray also that you would bless uh, Calvary Chapel over, or, sorry, Simple Truth over in Ghana, Lord Clement and his family there. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to put that down there because I know if I have a water bottle up here, I'll smack it over at some point early on. All right, so we are going to be in the book of Acts today, Acts chapter 3. Back when uh, Jeff and Lori had COVID, we started a series. I wasn't really expecting it to be a series, honestly, because I wasn't expecting you guys to get COVID. But uh, we started talking about Peter and how he was discipled by Jesus and the things that he went through, and um, that ended up being a four-study-long sort of series that, that we looked at how Jesus taught Peter. And, um, you know, all of that, to me, was because I wanted to get to here where we are today in Acts chapter 3, where we see how... Peter applies the things that he learned from Jesus. Uh, bef but before we get in that, I wanted to kind of summarize as briefly as possible the things that, that Peter learned, um, you know, four studies in two sentences, all right? The first one is that it's impossible to follow Jesus and be his disciple unless you take up your cross daily and follow him. That was one of the major lessons that Peter had to learn. And the, the second one is, it's okay to mess up, but just keep getting up and following Jesus. And that's, that was really driven home as we looked at how Peter denied Jesus three times when Jesus was crucified, and then how Jesus restored him afterwards at uh, the 
Sea of Galilee as they were together, and he told Jesus, or sorry, he told Peter, feed my lambs. So um, I think that that part especially for me is important to keep in mind that Peter was the kind of guy that we know more about his failures than we know about his successes, I think. Just the, the way that he was always falling down, he was always messing up, he was always sticking his foot in his mouth. And as we read here in, in Acts chapter 3 and 4, he is like in his prime form. He never makes a mistake here in these chapters. He always knows what to do. He always knows what to say. But remember where he came from. And it's important also to me to remember that this isn't like something that he settled into and he was perfect from then on. In the book of Galatians, Paul talks about how he ran into Peter and had to rebuke him because he was messing up. This is Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. And that's a whole story, and he talks about that in Galatians. You can read it if you like. Um, but just as a sort of reminder, Peter didn't become this perfect, faultless man after Jesus died, and he took control of the church. He wasn't infallible, um, but he was persistent. He wasn't perfect, but he always got up again. So that was Peter's discipleship that we looked at over that course of last year. Um, but we know that, that the whole point of Jesus' discipleship and training was that he wanted Peter to be a leader in his church. He told him early on, that was the first thing that he told Peter, I'm going to build my church upon you. So this morning, we're going to look at how Peter stepped into that role. And to me, I, I, I wasn't planning to, you know, talk about church leadership this morning, um, way back in November when we started this series, and then Jeff asked if I'd fill in today. Um, but it's interesting to think about all the different things that have come together accidentally that we just happen to be talking about church leadership. I, I'm in Joshua on Wednesday nights, and that's heavily focused on the way that Josh led Israel into uh, Canaan. Jeff has been talking about church leadership in First Timothy for weeks now. Interesting to think about how all of that has come together. We didn't plan that. It's just where God has us. I, I think that God is wanting us all, not me and Jeff, but everybody to to be thinking about how they are leaders in the church. So, like I said, we're going to start in, in Acts chapter 3. Um, by this point in Acts, the Holy Spirit has come and filled the church, and at Pentecost, it, it, Peter stood up in front of the crowd that gathered at, at that spectacle as they're all speaking in tongues and stuff, and preached the gospel, and it says 3,000 people got saved. And the church, by the point we get to in Acts chapter 3, is kind of got a rhythm going of worshiping together, praying together, helping each other out, and listening to the apostles' doctrine. It was kind of the honeymoon phase for them. They hadn't yet experienced trouble. They hadn't yet um, had persecution of the church. Uh, in fact, it, it talks about in Acts chapter 2 how because of the miracles that were happening through the Holy Spirit and the apostles, People were in awe of them. Even if they weren't part of the church, they were kind of afraid to approach them. So they, they were kind of insulated. And that changes here as we get into Acts chapter 3. We're going to see the honeymoon period's over, and Peter is going to provide leadership for the church as they have this first bout of persecution that hasn't ended yet. We're still in this, uh, this phase of being persecuted. So here we go. This is the example that we have to follow. Acts Chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a, and a lame man from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I have, or sorry, what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong, and leaping up he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. 
And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now I want to point out before anything else that Peter and John didn't go to the temple to make a scene that day. They weren't expecting even to to find this lame beggar and heal them. They were just going to worship God. They were minding their own business. And it, it kind of reminded me, actually this morning, I was reminded of a friend of mine that served with me when I was in Hungary briefly. Uh, he was there for a summer. And he, we were both pretty young. I think I was 19. He was maybe 20. And I remember him sort of getting fixated on the verse where Jesus talks about how his disciples are going to do even greater miracles than he did. And he was, he was always talking about, how come we don't ever see the thing? Like, Jesus healed people. How come we don't get to heal people? Why don't I get to see that? I want to heal somebody. And so I remember being on a bus with him, and we were driving down Magoslati Utsa. And I see him just staring at somebody, and I look at who he's staring at, and there's a, a woman on the bus, and she's got one arm on the, you know, handle, and her other arm is kind of just dangling. She had a withered arm. You could see her fingers coming out of her sleeve. And I'm thinking, oh, here goes Billy. <laughs> and right after I saw that, the bus stopped. This was her stop. This lady got off, and Billy pushed past me and followed her out. I didn't get out of the bus. Billy's gone. And uh, he didn't speak a lick of Hungarian, like zero. He could not communicate with it at all. And he was, he chased her down and he's, I'm going to pray for your arm. It's going to get better. I'm going to, and she ran away from him. Like, no way. Get away from me, man. I never saw her again. And uh, that's not what Peter and John are doing. They're not there to like create the scene. They weren't out looking for opportunities to heal somebody. They're just going to worship God. And as we do that when we just mind our own business and go off to worship God. That's the kind of things that God puts together. It happens all the time. So as they're going out there, minding their own business, they came across somebody who had, who had a need. And they looked at each other. Hey, we can do something about this. Why would we not do something about this? They didn't meet all of this guy's needs. They said, hey, we don't have any money. We can't do anything about that. We, they're not going to you know, solve every single problem that we come across. But they saw a problem that they could do something about, and they said, hey, we don't have money. Sorry, but we can give you the name of Jesus. And so in the name of Jesus, get up. And so here this guy jumps up from the ground. I love his reaction of finally being able to use his feet. It says later on that this guy was about 40 years old, and he finally gets to use his legs. And so he's just going to jump. And so he just is jumping around, walking, leaping, praising God. It's, it kind of reminds me of my kids. Look, Dad, look how high I can jump. And here's this guy jumping around, praising God. And it makes a scene, right? That's what you would expect. Verse 11. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portfolio called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and the righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead, to this we are witnesses, and by his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all. So when Peter saw a need, he met the need. When he saw an opportunity, he took it, and he began to preach Jesus. There was no way that he was going to let anybody give him credit for healing he said, hey, that's not me, which is, by the way, a pretty far cry from the way the disciples used to act. If you remember, they used to argue about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom, and that would have been right up their alley to have somebody think that they healed a, a lame man. But they've learned from that. They're not in, into that anymore, and so as soon as Peter sees that they're looking at him as the guy that, that healed somebody, he falls all over himself. Nope, that's not me. It's Jesus. And he reminds them of their own fault in his sin they were, or in his death. 
and how they put him on the cross. But he also talks about how faith in Jesus can heal, and he directs them to uh, repent and believe so that they can be forgiven, verse 19 and 20. It says, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of, of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. And we're not, Peter goes on from there, and we're not going to read all of the message that Peter gives to these people, um, because this is the point where the church starts to see trouble, and it focuses on uh, Peter and John. So we're going to skip down to chapter 4, where it says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. So the officials of the temple, Sadducees, the guys, whoever there are, um, the important religious people, they don't like what's going on in their front yard. This is their territory. They don't like that. It's funny, actually, to think about how these religious leaders are totally okay with this lame, starving man in their front yard, and they're not going to do anything about it. They don't mind that. He can just be there. We're not going to help him. But as soon as, he help, as somebody helps him and, and proclaims Jesus is the way to be resurrected from the dead, then that's a problem. So for the disciples, they follow the example of Jesus. And as the court officials and everybody comes up to them, they just go along with being arrested. It says that 5,000 people believed at that moment. They, were, they had a, a huge crowd. They were hanging on Peter and John's every word. I think that if Peter and John had decided, hey, I think we're not under arrest. What are you going to do about it? They would not have been under arrest. But they, they, like I said, they followed the example of Jesus. They didn't resist. And I think by doing that, they actually avoided a pretty big pitfall. Because what do you think would have happened if Peter and John had said, hey, guys, these Sadducees think I'm under arrest. What do you guys say about that? At that point, there's a riot. And nobody is going to remember the message of Jesus. They're not going to remember salvation through repentance. They're going to remember that there was a riot, and that's going to be the whole focus of everyone's memory for that day. I think it's very easy for us as believers to forget the focus of what our message is supposed to be. And for Peter and John, it could have very easily turned from, hey, we're talking about Jesus, to we're talking about the Sadducees. And they would have been known as the, the anti-court official guys or the anti-Sadducee guys. But we always want to be remembered as the pro-Jesus guys. And so that's what they do. They just go along with it. It's okay. You guys can arrest us. And it uh, reminds me of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 38. It says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you to take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus had told the disciples, you're going to be persecuted and they remembered that. Um, so as they came across the need, they filled it. As they came across the opportunity, they took it. And they accepted the consequences of serving Jesus, of preaching in his name, without complaining about it also. They just allowed themselves to be arrested. Verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what, or by what name do you do this? So the actions of the council here make it pretty obvious what their motivations are, what their priorities are. They get all the muckety-mucks they can together. Like, here is the high priest. Here's the, the former high priest. Here's the high priest family. Like, anyone who's got any kind of official 
name or title or something, they're going to be put on the high council. And they challenge Peter and John. Here's a couple of fishermen. They were in the, on the other side. Hey, what important people can you give us? What names can you say that will be impressive to us? Because there's no way that they have more authority than we do. They were thinking that they were going to intimidate Peter and John. They were going to impress them with their high titles and all of the officials and, um, you know, make them just bow down. Well, we know who gave Peter and John the authority to heal. They gave them the authority to preach in his name. Jesus did when he was calling his disciples together and sending them out. This is in Luke chapter 9 and 1 and 2. It says, and he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So they're working under Jesus' authority. And we know when Peter answers the council that that authority is still vested in them because it says that the, the Holy Spirit inspires what he says in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers, of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this this man was healed, let it be known to you, to all of you, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So Peter, he doesn't back down. He, he's not at all cowed by the impressive authorities that are gathered in the council, but he doesn't give them any disrespect either. Um, but, you know, if they thought that he was going to be impressed by them, he's not. Who said that we could do this? Jesus said that we could do this. You remember him. You had him crucified not too long ago. But God raised him from the dead. And for Peter, this is just another opportunity to preach the gospel. He sees that they're asking him questions. Hey, who said you could do this? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Remember, he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead. He's not going to pass up an opportunity to to preach Jesus. And he's not going to leave any room for any sort of doubt either that hey, you guys did this. And in fact, you guys are, as officials, you were supposed to recognize that Jesus is your chief cornerstone. You should have been waiting for him, you builders, and you rejected him. And yet, he's actually offering them a chance to repent. You know, you can see the motivations of the council are, are to be impressive, to have human authority, and you can see the motivations of Peter are, hey, here's an opportunity for you guys to repent and be saved. You, you need Jesus. There's no other name on earth by which man must be saved. So he's not anti-authority. He's not anti-Sadducee. He is pro-Jesus. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I thought it was kind of funny last week that uh, Jeff never knew that I had not graduate from Bible college. It's actually kind of funny because I took a test to get out of high school early. And so I technically the last thing I graduated from was junior high, which makes sense now, right? Why I've been in youth ministry for like 20 years. It just kept me there. It's good. But here's the thing. The qualifications of Bible college or seminary or ministry training, certificates, all of that stuff, God doesn't need that. God doesn't need qualifications. And those things, they're not bad. Of course, they're not bad. But it's not a thing that God needs anyone to have in order to use him. And that applies to all of you as much as it applies to me. You know, you don't have to go to Bible college. You don't have to have letters behind your name in order to be able to tell people about Jesus. The thing that Peter and John had is the only thing that anybody needs. They were with Jesus. In the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul talked about this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. 
For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose, chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And so it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So Peter and John, I think what they have there, that little verse about how they were uneducated and common men, and yet they perceived that they had been with Jesus, that is like my aspiration. That's what I am going for. Verse 14. But seeing the man, the man who was healed standing before them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had c- commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So these threats and the, the response of Peter and John are kind of just the culmination of everything that they've been talking about before. You can see the, the mindset of the, the council is completely on their own pomp and human authority and what makes them better than everybody else. And the mindset of Peter and John is, hey, we're listening to God. Sorry, we're not going to listen to you. And in fact, I think that they are intentionally putting the council in the spot. Like, hey, you guys need to think about this. You guys should consider whose authority you are working under. Are you following what God has told you to do, or are you just filled up with your own human authority? You know, who do you guys think that we should serve? But for them, they said, there's no way we're going to stop. We're going to just talk about what we've seen and heard. They're like the prophet Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah talking about himself. In Jeremiah chapter 20, he talks about how he tried to stop teaching God's word. He tried to, to hold it in. This is Jeremiah 20 verse 9. He said, if, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary with holding it in, and I cannot. So these threats of the council, they're not going to stop Peter and John. They've got a fire in their bones, and they're not going to hold it in. And they've got this guy next to them, this 40-year-old man who has not walked before, and he's standing there in, in the presence. Like, what could you possibly say to counterman what we have here right here? And what I like about this is that they say, we're going to keep talking about what we've seen and heard. And we can all do that, right? Just like I said, we don't have to go to Bible college. You don't have to have degrees or anything else. When God gives you opportunities, like, you know, there's 5,000 people that want to hear what you just said, or there is a council of authorities who are demanding that you explain your actions, or you just have family and friends who want to know what's going on with your life. You can talk about what you've seen and heard. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible answer man. You know, it, it's okay to say I don't know. And I remember having a, a coworker that was just very antagonistic, not at church. It was at a different place. Um, very antagonistic towards me because I was a believer. And he used to love to ask me these weird philosophical questions about the nature of sin and God and everything else. And he thought it was the he thought he won if he got me to say I don't know. But I'm not going to pretend that I don't that I know everything. I'm not going to pretend that I, I have this all figured out. If anyone has this all figured out, you can please explain it to me. But for me, I, all I can say is what I've seen and heard. This is what I've experienced in my own life. There's how God has worked in me to change me to be more like him. Here's my son who has been healed from half a heart. 
You know, it's, these are the things that I've seen and heard. These are the things that I've handled with my life. Everyone can do that. Everyone has that story. Everyone has their own testimony, and that's what God wants out of us, not to be scholars, not to have all the answers, not to know, you know, 10,000 verses memorized or be able to list all the books of the Bible in order. Those are fine. Those are good things to do. But to be able to tell somebody what God has done in your own life is what's going to be powerful as a testimony to them. So this right here is the first time that the church experienced any kind of persecution, any sort of pushback from sharing the gospel. And Peter, as a disciple of Jesus, showed us the example that we can follow. But the aftermath of this persecution, the trial and the arrest and the, you know, interrogation that they go through, I think is, um, it's something that, that, well, we're going to read it. But for us, it's the model that I think we should have in our response to persecution, whether it's something that, you know, we are currently in, you know, we're running for our lives in the streets from the Gestapo, or if it's just persecution that we see in the horizon, here is the attitude of the church after all of this, and it should be our attitude as well. So this is Acts chapter 4, 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in, vain, plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of, of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to Continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through your name of your whole through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So the church got together, they told the story, here's what happened, here's what they said to us, and they decided we need to pray about this. And they got together and they prayed and they acknowledged God's sovereignty. They talked about how it was within God's plan, not only for Jesus to be crucified, but also that there would be persecution of his, of his believers afterwards. They acknowledged this is the thing that you told us was going to happen. It's not outside of your power or your plan, God. And so our response to that, please help us to be bold. Please help us to continue to preach the name of Jesus despite what anyone says to us, despite the pushback that we get. Help us to remember to listen to God and not to the human authorities. And that's the boldness that, that I think all of us should be praying for. That's what I pray for, that I wouldn't be too embarrassed to talk about my Savior, that I wouldn't, you know wait for somebody else to bring up Jesus before I know that it's safe to talk to them about Jesus. <laughs> it's funny because it's relatable, right? I, we've got, uh, we're adopting a dog, and we're adopting it from this family that moved to a small area. In fact, the dog is at my house right now. He might be on my couch, which I'm not into. Dogs belong outside. Anyway, this family... Um, just, they just started talking to me about Jesus and about the things that they do in their church, and I thought, man, I'm a pastor. I should be the one to bring up Jesus to these people. It, but we need boldness. That's the end of the story, right? And, and not to worry about the consequences of what might take place. Peter and John saw that there was going to be consequences, and they said, all right, we're going to bear them. That's going to be how it's going to be. And God is going to be with us, and, and God is going to use us, even this persecution, to spread the word. So... That's my prayer for us, that our boldness would not be uh, hindered at all by persecution that we see on the horizon. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for...
the example of, of Peter and John, the things that you hammered into them through your discipleship of, the, of them and how they should act, how they should live, the things that, that should be important to them, the things that should not be important to them. And we pray that you would help us to follow their example. We pray that you would help us to be bold with your word, that we would be eager to, to share with anyone who would ask us and, and even people who don't ask us who our Savior is and, and how you saved us. Help us to um, have that ready in our pocket, the things that, are, that we have seen and heard, and, and help us to see the opportunities that you open for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand for one more song.
Awesome in power forever. Awesome in great is your name. You overcame. Amen. What a great song to leave with. I kicked my water bowl over. It's Chekhov's water bottle. All right, guys, we're stacking chairs, right? Yep, all right. God bless you guys. Have a great week.